Mega Man is a pretty famous 2D side-scroller. Famous mostly for the 8-bit titles, the jumping and shooting with the colorful characters, and taking powers from bosses in any order you want. It's a franchise that grew beyond those roots, but never really abandoned that essence of the classic franchise, even into radical reimaginings like Battle Network. As the franchise evolved, different design and development decisions were made. Mega Man 2 added E-Tanks, and inspired by Mega Man 1's Magnet Beam, added item parts that would later games would uh, develop into rush transformations. Mega Man 3 added a slide to the moveset that expanded mobility. This mostly meant a faster method of moving, but occasionally dodging, jumping enemies, or projectiles. Mega Man 4 added the charge shot. We'll get to it. Mega Man 5 added Beat, which was unlocked after getting specific items within a level. 6 added two super armors with Rush, um, but the essential formula for these NES titles never changed. They only grew from what was there in Mega Man 1. Getting off the Nintendo Entertainment System proved a challenge for Mega Man in sequel transitioning. By Mega Man 6 and the end of the console's lifespan, the formula had been pretty clearly defined. Was this formula too limiting? Did it hold innovation back? On the Super Nintendo, we had Mega Man X and Mega Man 7. Mega Man X approached the increased graphic capability by adding detail and having a good sense of speed and fluidity to it. Detail and fluidity were the goals. The story became more complex and urgent than the simplicity of the classic series. It also streamlined the elements of hidden items into more physical and tangible rewards the player wanted to seek out, such as armor upgrades, sub-tanks, and heart pieces. The scope of Mega Man widened, literally and metaphorically. These maps became more complex as X was given more movement options with his dash and wall climb. But I'm actually not here to talk about Mega Man X today, though I love it. Seven's design decisions though, and I also love Mega Man 7, uh, became more of an identity crisis. Now, perhaps to differentiate itself from Mega Man X, or perhaps to promote the idea of classic as a very specific kind of game, Mega Man 7's approach to gameplay meant big, slow, moving sprites that emphasized this cartoon appeal of classic Mega Man. There were also more hidden options within stages, such as the rush adapters actually becoming unlocks similar to the beat options in previous games by spelling out rush. There was also stuff like Pro Demand Shield quest line um, and, or like a rush search. Uh, this game encouraged the player to look for secrets. The game was also the first mainline game to feature an item shop. This meant the game was more forgiving and splitting the robot masters in half for the first half of the game and then bringing the uh, latter four around after a middle level was also a deliberate design choice that feels interesting for the sake of directed uh, you know, d difficulty but also makes the non-linear routing that was so appealing to the franchise more absent. Mega Man 8 also had an identity crisis and took a lot of heavy notes from Mega Man 7. Most of these elements stayed, like splitting of the robot masters or the game becoming easier, um, but I will say that the shop now focuses on bolts being uh, a hidden thing rather than some uh, currency you could grind for. Um, the game had some lacking moments and it felt like it had to lean on some bullet points to sell the title, such as the ball Mega Man kicks that's introduced in the first stage. You know, an interesting tool that you could definitely use and abuse if you know it, but it's also not something that persists within the hearts of gamers or the game's design philosophy. After this, the classic series sort of went into a hiatus. There were, you know, small titles, but you know. Other spin-offs in the franchise were flourishing and evolving. Technology was enabling these innovations, and instead the classic series was sort of collecting dust and doing those occasional releases of collections, like the Anniversary Collection, or the GBA port of Rockman and Forte becoming Mega Man and Bass. Uh, then, as time pushed further on, and NT Creates was developing the Zero and ZX series, and Star Force was also coming out, they didn't know it at the time, but the era of the wide Mega Man presence was coming to a close. Even now, people hope for a Mega Man X9 or a Legends 3. The end of 2008 brought about Mega Man 9, 
as early as 2004, Keiji Inafune, the basically at the time the franchise leader, he he was doing he did character designs and was like a producer on multiple Mega Man projects. So he was noted as like the the father of Mega Man, though that title is dubious. Um, but he expressed a desire for a Mega Man game that went back to the original identity of the NES games. The evolving industry meant shifting expectations, and the scale of Mega Man being this blockbuster game it used to be was becoming impossible, even more so by the day. But the evolving industry also allowed for new and developing markets. The presence of marketplaces like Xbox Live Arcade and WiiWare meant mainstream console support not only independently developed titles, but just even smaller affordable scale projects for big companies. You know, it's a perfect testing ground for any kind of game. Um, NT Creates, the developers behind the Mega Man Zero series and ZX series, and I just want to say here that I love the Zero series, NT Creates was tasked with making Mega Man 9, another sequel in the classic series. The producers at Capcom were worried about making an 8-bit only game. At this point in time, the retro look was starting up but it was not insanely popular in smaller circles. And they thought the only people who would be interested would be diehard fans, which uh, is not enough money. The developers weren't just making any Mega Man game though. This game was intended not to just aesthetically go back to the roots of the NES games, but specifically build off the base of Mega Man 2, a game considered by many, um, especially them at the time, to be the best Mega Man game. It's much more, you know, than a Mega Man 3, but for real. Um, it it does consider the whole franchise, but now I'm going to actually talk about Mega Man 9. Mega Man 9 is a beautiful examination and ultimately a justification of old design elements. Do developers innovate and refine because these newer aspects are actually better? Or are these pillars of design products of industry in themselves? Relevance is the central theme of the game in every single part, from the story to the aesthetic to the level design and movement. Do design concepts only have a time and place, dependent on vague thoughts like, you had to be there, or, well, it was good for its time. The story of Mega Man 9 is, in my opinion, the most complex and rewarding of the classic series. Some fans think maybe it's, you know, eight's use of evil energy and aliens. Uh, or maybe it's King's plot in Rockman and Forte, or it's Terra and the aliens from Mega Man V, or maybe it's the Robo Enza from Mega Man 10. But for me, pound for pound, I think Mega Man 9 both offers a nice simplicity and a wonderful subtext regarding the developer intentions. The story starts with robots breaking loose and attacking the city. Dr. Wily has gone on public television and pointed the finger at Dr. Light, who apparently has a taped confession. Wily bravely and courageously takes donations to help fight the menace. It's up to Mega Man, Otto, and Roll to uncover the mystery and stop these robot masters. Now, spoiler alert, Wily was behind it all. But and more importantly is the robot master dynamics at play. The robot masters all once served normal functions, but they were ne nearing their expiration dates. Uh, Mega Man takes it as a natural reality of the world. You know, when a robot's time is up, they have to be decommissioned. These robots have a will to live, though, and they teamed up or were tricked by Dr. Wily into working for him to protect themselves from death. This plot is literally Blade Runner. Mega Man is literally fucking Deckard. Oh my god. Instead of a conversation, though, about, like, what it means to be human, it's much more a conversation similar to, like, all these fucking sequels of movies that are made 30 years after the movie came out and the action stars starred in the title. These legacy movies that ask the question, you know, does Rocky or Rambo still got it? Or do the old ways still work? Uh, fucking Top Gun Maverick shit. <laughs> uh, I, I like those movies, it's fine. Uh, Mega Man 9 asks questions regarding the franchise itself. Is Mega Man past his expiration date? Are his best games behind him? 
What about 8-bit games in general? Does art have a time limit of appreciation when it's this attached to the technology and design of the time? This game is confident in placing itself as an old school classic NES game. Even now in 2023, there's a lot of 8-bit games and tributes to franchises that seek a lot of modern quality of life refinements or expansions or innovations with more modern gameplay styles. You know, for many, it's not good enough to be a Ninja Gaiden clone. Now it's got to have Metroidvania elements or roguelike elements. It's got to have this and that. Um, and the trend chasing of the industry still permeates in these titles. Even something like Indie creates his own Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, which is another retro throwback meant to be inspired by Castlevania 3, um, has many quality of life and gameplay innovations that feel beyond more the mere organic e expansion. I'm trying to say is that games like that feel like, you know, 2018 indie games wanting to pretend to be a 1989 title without flaws or without what it is. You know, now to be clear, Mega Man 9 could not exist on an NES. And it doesn't feature lessons only from the NES games. But I'm, I'm trying to say that Mega Man 9 is a 2008 game that considers Mega Man was at its best in 1987 and 88 and uses that principle as the foundation. With every other lesson or gameplay contrivance that the industry or the franchise has learned as something to carefully consider rather than something to be part of the core experience. You know, so confident in this foundation that 9 abandons even the basic innovations that 3, 4, 5, and 6 would add to the N Nintendo Entertainment System formula. You know, certain collections or re-releases offer quality of life for the NES games to like quick switch your weapons or have an alt fire for your shooter over the power you have. Um, 9, Mega Man 9 requires you to go to the menu every time you want to switch your weapons. Something like that, you know, is something that even Mega Man 10 doesn't fucking do. But that offers a break in pace for the sake of strategy and allows you to breathe, even in the most hectic moments. More importantly to everyone watching and the thing that you are probably immediately thinking, the slide and charge shot were removed from Mega Man's moveset. These options actually posed more complex issues for developers and players. You know, they're tools used to solve problems, but became dominant forces within these games over basic options, especially the charge shot. I'm not going to keep harping on it, but there's a lot of commentary and discourse on whether or not the charge shot ruined Mega Man design. And you can at least look at the idea that it prepped you for engagements and encouraged a specific way to play and emphasized the buster over the ultimate utility over typical robot master powers. It was just easier to use the fucking charge. Um, and it also encouraged buster only gameplay, which is very rewarding for some players, but that's a very specific mode of play. Um, and there is a big asterisk to this, which is proto man mode, but we'll get there when we get there. I'm, I'm aware of it. This removal, though, allows other aspects to shine, such as the consistency of Mega Man's own movement and the utility of every robot master power. And, indeed, these are some of the most useful and powerful robot master powers in the franchise. You know, it's nothing as ever-present and dominant as two's metal blades, which were ubiquitous in direction and you could just fucking fire so many because there was so much ammo for it and it hit most enemies for a lot of damage uh but instead every power has something really useful to it and is oftentimes the best incarnation of such a power jewel man's shield for instance is pretty much invincible and it will stay there forever unless you screen transition or you touch an enemy that takes more than one hit this leads to high stress segments being easily solved and providing opportunities for grinding in a similar way to the charged armor armadillo alt from Mega Man X. The uh, other weapons have utilities and purposes too, like the black hole bombs offering maneuverability, same thing with the homing bees, the charge shot of the magma bazooka, or the concrete blocks that offer amazing platforms. 
you know, the or the fucking screen clear of the tornado. You know what I mean? Um, the one element from the more modern games that stuck around was the item shop. Yes, farming is back. You know, the search and finding of specific boat bolts, you know, that... That is not the game design philosophy of what Nine wants to be. Nine doesn't want to be this pseudo adventure exploration thing. Exploration is not the name of the game in Mega Man. You know, in this, you have opportunities to make your game easier, though, through investing in unique power ups and items. So, like, there's still. There's still a reason why the developers wanted it, you know, extra lives, E-Tanks, the energy equalizer. Maybe you don't want to, you know, an insta-kill death spike, so you want to get out of jail free card. You know, adding this shop allows players to engage with the difficulty and allows developers to take a more recent Mega Man innovation that feels a little bit more modern and compromise without compromising the actual level design this way the base game can remain but players will be able to engage with it with the tools given on the side likewise there's plenty of ways to address stages you know if you've studied youtubers talking about Mega Man level design i'm not going to go over it but i'll just say that these essential elements are maintained like conveyance or you know anything like that or the creativity of the gimmicks um, if you ever feel the difficulty brushing up abrasively against you, the game empowers you. Alternative pathing is not a focus of the game to get past levels, but instead gives you goodies or an alternative encounter within the same screen, a different problem within the same problem, and a risk and reward, which we'll get to later. Some solutions or alternative methods are as old as time. You know, just using a fucking jet to bypass segments of the world you don't want to deal with. But what about concrete blocks that freeze the lava beams? Or the black hole bombs or hornets reaching enemies that are otherwise impossible to hit? Or the plug ball telling you where the hologram platforms are, just like the lead bubble did in Mega Man 2. And notice what I just said. These are not new design elements. This shit can be found in other Mega Man games. These are just carefully understood and given to the player on a comprehensive level. You know, all the time, every screen. The return to the 8-bit graphics doesn't mean the art direction suffers either. Instead, it feels as if it retains that consistent identity with these original titles. It feels like Mega Man never left. It helps that the soundtrack is among the best of the series. To speak on other games in the franchise, Mega Man has always looked back into the past and used elements of level design or character design to reshape current titles. You know, at the end of the game, Mega Man does indeed count nine previous mainline entries where he beat Wily's ass. You know, Tornado Man and Splash Woman greatly resemble Harpuya and Leviathan from the Zero titles. The titles Inti Creates was responsible for. You know, little stage things matter too, even to the minute things, like Splash Woman's bubble segment recalling Wave Man's bubble segments in Mega Man 5. The game is not just a sequel to Mega Man 2, like previously stated. Rather an appreciation for what's come before but by grabbing and seizing the roots of the franchise. And I'm just going to keep gushing about some cool moments real quick. Wily's tower is amazing, especially the bosses. The twin devils and the Wily 1 boss is amazing. You know, in moments you feel the urgency and immediately understand how the boss works. You know, I like certain level hazards like the little spike death traps of Jewel Mans or the mini bosses that utilize your abilities and how well you pay attention. The flower boss, the falling rock boss, the magma dragon, the elephants, all of that shit is really cool. It feels natural to the franchise. For an alternative perspective on design though, we need to look no further than the downloadable content of the game, Proto Man Mode. Now, Proto Man is secretly the Chad option of the game. Playing as Proto Man enables really big gameplay differences. The big positives are they give you a charge attack and slide. And I just spent fucking minutes telling you you didn't want the charge attack and slide. And now I am? You know, the other nice bonuses are the shield that can block projectiles if aimed right and getting the jet parts at the start. And I mean, just look at this dude. He's cool. With Proto Man, you can actually inspect this game's level design and how a classic Mega Man game functions with both playstyles. 
you'll find that yes, sliding around and charging the Bunster can stomp the game in certain areas. There are levels built with this gap in mind, and enemies too. With seeing these benefits, you still don't miss them as Mega Man. Mega Man's perfectly viable without them. And, I mean, hopefully you already beat the game as the as Mega Man, but, you know, the other thing is, is the, de the developers actually balanced Proto Man to not break the game. They gave him huge drawbacks. It's harder for enemies to touch you, so now you take twice the knockback and twice the damage. Ouch. If you just thought Proto Man was going to be an easier time, you're wrong. When you make a mistake in Proto Man mode, you feel it. The benefits are given with flawless execution. Mega Man 9 challenges the player. The Buster Charge seems harder to balance against. Um, so, you know, because the boss weapons are still useful, even if you didn't do anything to change the balance. But the developers did do something. They, they nerfed the smaller Buster Shots. Mega Man can shoot three lemons. Proto Man shoots two lemons on screen at once. This incentivizes you to not mash the normal fire, but rather carefully charge or change weapons. So, you know, th those are important aspects that still inform the design. And and you, it's a beautiful contrast and compare situation. Uh, Proto Man also, for instance, doesn't have the item shop. You know, there's no auto selling you extra lives. So his game is a more pure experience of pain. You know, there's no grinding to fix it. Only the items within the game itself. Here we see the reasons the item shop exists if you're having trouble. It's a challenging mode in and of itself. He embodies an important aspect of the game and an important aspect of fun. Risk and reward. Risk reward is a major value in Mega Man as a game, even for casual players. It's one of the reasons you can choose your stage between levels. The non-linear routing enables you to craft your own path of difficulty that may or may not reward you in the way you want it. I start with Galaxy Man as my first boss, instead of uh, Splash Woman, which is probably one of the more common ones. Uh, whenever I feel like it's time to jump to Splash Woman, I do get to her out of order sometimes. Um, and it helps that the jet appears after beating five robot masters instead of a specific robot master. And other than boss weaknesses, the game actually has plenty of room for you to start in any order. And if you start with Splash Woman, you'd likely end with Hornet Man. And there's a, like, there's a lot of instances where you want Hornet Man to take all those little goodies on the sides of the stage. Um, other examples of risk and reward include all the little power-ups surrounded by spikes. Look at that fucking M-Tank on Wily Stage 3. Oh my god. I could go on and on, but I think we should just finish up this little worship video by looking at how Mega Man 9 ends. Mega Man has defeated Dr. Wily again. In the aftermath, Dr. Light's name is cleared, and the robot masters with these expiration dates are given new leases on life. The expiration dates don't matter. They're outdated. They're you know they're not outdated. They're repurposed into new jobs, new homes. For Mega Man, it seems Doctor Wily has escaped yet again. As long as the world is threatened, Mega Man Nine states pretty clearly, thematically, Mega Man will always have a purpose. Perhaps just new homes. Mega Man Nine is special not only because it's fun but because of the cultural context of the franchise and its presence as a game that justifies it, that justifies the retro experience without compromise. It doesn't hand wave it away or use it as an aesthetic crutch. It stands to say these old school design elements have a right to exist in the modern era. The old world finds a new home in the new world. While smaller in scope, Mega Man won't be the blockbuster it used to be, but now Mega Man never has to have his best games behind him. Mega Man 9 was a success on WiiWare and the Xbox Live Marketplace. Mega Man 10 would follow after, so would Mega Man 11, which changed the aesthetic back to a more modern 3D uh, aesthetic, but maintaining a nice core gameplay. But those are videos for another time. For me, what's special is Mega Man 9 is just the most sincere justification of what was and can be rather than what is and can be. Thank you for watching everybody. This is my first uh, video essay. If you like my analysis, I do a podcast with someone named Murph. It's called the Daydreamcast. 
Um, and uh, I will also be doing other analysis videos. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching again.